Um, good morning, everyone. Um, we would like to start in like two or three minutes um, to wait for more audience to come. And so we'll start at 35 sharp. Okay, good morning. I'm welcome to our session. I'm Kelly Kim, general counsel at OpenNet Korea, and I'll be the moderator for next hour. And yeah, welcome. And our session, our workshop on network disruption across borders, will talk about internet shutdown. And what is um, internet shutdown or blackouts or network disruptions? It can be defined as an international disruption of internet or electronic communications, rendering them inaccessible or effectively unusable for a specific population or within a location, often to exert control over the flow of information. Um, so they also include blocks of social media platforms. To date, network disruptions have been perpetri perpetrated by governments in response to governance challenges ranging from elections and public protests to cheating on school exams. However, recently, these dis disruptions have spanned entire countries and also reach it across the borders in the form of attacks, cyber attacks that aim to prevent and mitigate cross-border cybersecurity threats. So this round table will discuss important questions implicated by this new trend. So our speakers will describe the range of disruptions currently taking place, illuminate the various impacts on human, economic, and social rights, as well as development, economic development, and seek to build and strengthen norms on internet access pursuant to the sustainable development goals and domestic and international laws. So let me introduce the panel. First, we have Melody Petri, Advocacy Director at Access Now, and she will talk about Access Now's work on internet shutdowns and um, the global Keep It On Coalition. And we next, 
left to myself. Uh, we have Amiel Rassidi, Internet Security and Digital Rights Researcher at Center for Human Rights in Iran. And he will talk about Iran's policy and national internet and how tech companies um, they are over complying with Iran tech sanctions and etc. And we have Koliwa Majama. Um, she is a um, Zimbabwean journalist and also organizer of the African School on Internet Governance, as well as media rights activists. And she will talk about Zimbabwe's case. And last but not, not the least, we have Ross Quillman, public policy officer of Etno, European Telecommunications Network Operators. And he will talk about impact of network shutdowns and um, policy response, how um, and how, and the way forward. So I will give each speaker seven to ten minutes, and then I will open the floor for about twenty minutes for comments and questions. So first, we have Melody. Thank you very much, Kelly, and thank you, everyone, for waking up early to this first session. Um, so my name is Melody. I'm Advocacy Director at Access Now. Um, Access Now does uh, a broad range of activities and, and work around digital rights, but uh, one of our uh, flagship campaigns, actually, is on internet shutdowns and internet disruption, and we are coordinating the Keep It On Coalition, which is a global campaign that now gathers over 200 members uh, in 70 something countries. And we are all uh, organizations from civil society. Our missions uh, are not all the same. Uh, you have organizations focusing on the monitoring of internet censorship and the measurement of internet shutdowns, for example, others or journalist unions and student associations who are affected by shutdowns. So the missions differ, but we are all united behind the, um, the objective to put an end to internet disruptions. And the, the reason why this coalition um, started in the first place is because we were observing a dangerous trend of um, the increase in the number of internet shutdowns around the world. The justifications that were being used varied, and I'm sure that we will discuss some of them with the specific case studies by Koliwe and, and also Amir in, in Zimbabwe and Iran. But across the world, um, different reasons were being given for government-triggered or intentional uh, internet disruptions. As Kelly mentioned during the introduction, the disruptions vary also in nature. Uh, one of my colleagues has actually developed a very lengthy document called Anatomy of a Shutdown, looking at all the different ways um, that authorities can uh, interfere with internet connectivity and access. And so we've been trying to advocate against a shutdown, but also do preventive work to understand why uh, authorities would decide to, to shut down the internet in the first place and talk about the impact that internet shutdowns have because one of the topics of this session is also uh, maybe like the connection between cyber attacks and the, 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 the threats in cyberspace as well as internet disruption. And when we see that states are very keen to try to establish norms and agreements to prevent uh, cyber attacks, when we see that there is a real concern over the impact of cyber attacks, we see an opposite trend where states themselves order internet shutdown that have sometimes a very similar impact in the fact that people no longer have access to information, uh, specific services, or all of a sudden being confisca confiscated and inaccessible. So the impact on various rights beyond freedom of expression, uh, beyond of sometimes the ability to, um, to organize and mobilize online, but even in terms of accessing uh, educational services, access to healthcare, 
uh, proposed online, these are all affected. And we, for us, it was important to be part of this discussion here at IGF because we, we want to make sure that we do not disregard the impact of, of uh, shutdowns and states have to, to, to work with us on this issue in the same way that they are concerned about uh, cyber attacks and about the, the impact beyond borders or across borders of, of cyber attacks, uh, beyond their, their willingness to um, uh, regulate or to establish norms. For us, it's really important that they also see the impact of internet shutdowns and that they help civil society in reversing this trend that we're, that we're seeing with really dangerous internet disruptions that have uh, consequences that I'm sure we will have the opportunity to, to discuss. And indeed, when we talk about the, 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 the rules in the cyberspace, the, 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 the good behavior or what kind of behavior uh, actors should have um, in the cyberspace, these are all very important questions. Actually, in two weeks, the, the UN will host a, another discussion uh, not about internet governance, but about um, about uh, states' uh, responsibilities in, in the cyberspace with the discussions at the open-ended working group in New York in, in, yeah, in December. And so, as we're seeing this eagerness uh, from states to build new norms, agreements, and defensive capacities to stop cyber attacks, as indeed this, this is important, um, and, and, and we can see this focus on cross-border conflict, it's important to identify that while uh, perpetrating shutdowns, they are perpetrating similar kind of attacks, but on their own people. And I think this is something that is not said enough. Uh, we don't realize that um, the, these kind of measures that are rendering the internet inaccessible, whether it's through a blanket shutdown, a, a complete blackout, um, or whether it's through throttling, which means that people are no longer able to upload videos, they, they can no longer document um, what is going on, and especially in times of conflict, in, in, in times of protest, where we know the importance of having access to, to communications channels not just, as I said, for, for journalism purposes or for um, uh, even citizen journalism, but also to ensure that our loved ones are safe and secure, to ensure that uh, we have access to emergency services, to ensure that we know um, where there might be uh, unsafe areas not to go and, and what alternative traffic to take and, and, and so on. So, I think it's really important to not normalize um, the, the impact of, of shutdown and, and the fact that shutdowns are very often being used, not necessarily for the justification that are being given, uh, often like to um, contain violence during protests, to maintain public order, um, to prevent cheating during exam, as we said during the introduction, but also to spread, to, to prevent um, the spread of fake news and, and, and disinforma disinformation or hoax, especially during elections. I think that it's important to address the root causes of the, those issues. Disinformation existed before the internet. So shutting down the internet will not necessarily address the issue of disinformation. Just like if you cut my microphone while I'm yelling because I'm angry at someone, I will not stop being angry at that person and I will not stop yelling. You may not be able to hear me, um, but the root cause of my anger and the fact that I'm still yelling won't stop. So it's a clumsy metaphor, but I hope that we'll be able to, to address some of these issues. And I'm really uh, looking forward to hear from the other panelists about the, the specific incidents of, of internet shutdowns around the world and what can we do, what, what has been done already um, to respond, and, um, and how different parties, not just civil society, but telecommunication companies, regulators, um, authorities through mul multilateral uh, agreements and multilateral initiatives 
can also address both the issue of cyber attacks and of internet shutdowns and not necessarily see them as two different worlds, but see them as operations that can have a similar impact on population, but uh, played by different actors. Uh, thank you. Um, so, um, yeah, and I, I want Melody to later to answer the question of whether um, how cyber attacks in internet shutdowns or network disruptions are similar or different um, in, in these trends, new trends you see, access now see, and recently, as you, everyone may well know, that Telegram has been attacked, attacked several times uh, because, because Hong Kong protesters are using Telegram, are, are known to use Telegram to, to plan pro protests and all. And it, so it, it's another form of, I think it's another form of new cyber attack as well as um, network disruption. And next we have Amil. Thank you. Uh, well, uh, thank you for the opportunity uh, and thank you for everyone. Uh, before uh, actually going to talk about the recent internet shutdown in Iran, during the uh, past couple of days, I realized that unfortunately there is not uh, um, enough information out there about the Iran's uh, infrastructure and how they invest a lot of money and um, resources, in the, uh, especially after the 2009 presidential election, to create their own network, local network in Iran. And at the same time, they try to uh, pass laws in the parliament, put in place some policies to how to use this network. Um, and also, uh, uh, the another uh, factor that is really important about Iran that makes Iran quite unique among the other countries is uh, Internet in Iran, the government in Iran has absolute monopoly over the internet. So usually when you want to get internet, your internet connection, you go through your ISP and your ISP is able to, you know, uh, independently get the internet from outside world. But in Iran, actually you have to go through the governmental gateway and it's like they have absolute power over the internet. They can slow it down, they can disrupt it. And if it's necessary, like what we, witness like uh, last week, they can shut it down. Uh, so these are three main factors, uh, investing on infrastructure and, and uh, creating services. The second one, policy, putting uh, in place a policy and regulation to how to use this infrastructure. And the third one, uh, the, the only gateway that the government has absolute control over the gateway there are uh, three main actors that Iran actually invests a lot in order to have control, full control over the internet. Uh, unfortunately, we have, we have to deal with the, another one, which is like the problem of you no know, politic problem between Iran and the US government. And uh, the tech sanctions that US put in place actually helped Iranian government to uh, encourage people to come and use their own national infrastructure. Um, if you look at in the past, like three, almost three years ago in uh, January 2018, when protest was going on in Iran, they shut down the internet only for half an hour. And they couldn't, you know, continue to shut it down for more than half an hour because if they continued, it's, it was like obvious that country would be in a lot of problem, health system, like banking system, financial system, all of this system would be like collapse and they had to pay a huge price to keep the internet shut down. So they restored the internet after half an hour and they tried to just, you know, do the uh, traditional classic like disruption, blocking, censorship and things like that. Uh, from then to now, uh, they try to encourage all the businesses and individuals to bring their servers, their, their data centers, their 
uh, infrastructure in Iran and use Iran's national infrastructure, which, by the way, the infrastructure itself is not a bad thing. Uh, because of that infrastructure, actually, we have faster internet in Iran. But it's important who control the infrastructure, what policy control the infrastructure. So uh, people didn't want to, businesses and you know, individuals, didn't want to move in Iran and use Iran's national infrastructure because all of them, you know, all of us, we could see these days coming. They can use this infrastructure against us. They can shut it down, they can slow it down, they can censor it. So everyone preferred to keep their servers and everything outside the country. Unfortunately, because of the maximum pressure uh, of Trump policy, uh, all the tech companies start to ban Iranians to use their, national, their, their infrastructure, including uh, Digital Ocean, banned Iranian to use uh, uh, its services. Amazon Cloud, AWS, Google Cloud, and even some services of Google that you know developers use to develop their own uh, applications. So they left all of us with one unfortunate uh, uh, option, which was moving back in Iran and using Iran's national infrastructure. Uh, it's like it's like being like like entrapped. So. Uh, now, if you look at what's the big difference between like today's shutdown and almost like two, two years ago shutdown, during these five, six days that we have like al almost 100% uh, shutdown, all the, these, these national services, they were working, operating quite good. Uh, in, uh, January 2018, I was receiving report that, like for example, Iranian Uber Snap was not able to, you know, answer their, their, uh, its customer because simply they were using Google Map, and Google Map needs to use, you know, the international services. But today, all of these services were they were operating very well. Snap was working very well, and this is what Iranian government actually wants. They want to keep everything inside the country so they can have full control over the uh, infrastructure, and not infrastructure, communication. They are investing a lot on uh, national search engine, national emailing, email services, and even, you know, it can get a little bit more scary, even national uh, SSL certificate. So imagine if, you know, again, because of, uh, these tech sanctions, all of these people in Iran, they forced to use the Iran's national infrastructure and services. Basically, we left them with, uh, uh, with any kind of uh, shelter. The another problem, which is a little bit related to this uh, tech sanction, is uh, tech companies that actually they are over complying with the tech sanctions. Uh, in uh, Obama administration, Obama actually issued an uh, executive order, General License D1, which uh, based on that, general, uh, based on that uh, personal communication tools are not part of the sanctions, and some, some other uh, exception as well. But unfortunately, again, when Trump came to, came to the power and uh, put in place its maximum pressure program, uh, because of the fear atmosphere, most of the tech companies, they prefer to basically forget about everything, just, just simply uh, put aside the uh, 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 problem and block the entire, uh, all of their services on Iranian. Basically, they are over complying with the uh, take sanctions. So, uh, with this regard, these four main uh, items, what Iran did and what the, uh, on, on the uh, outside of Iran, uh, US did, uh, Iran's situation is quite unique among all of the countries that they shut down the internet. And I believe we have to look at this case as a case study, because, because all the other countries can look at Iran as a, as a like, kind of role model. They can, they can understand how Iran actually is able to control everything inside the country, working perfectly fine, and people, people would be like, uh, happy because you know, they have access to their services, but they don't have access to the outside world. So I believe that uh, one of the things that actually I learned is there is, unfortunately, there is not much in terms of 
uh, international pressure in terms of uh, telecommunication bodies regulation that uh, can do to a stop country like Iran shutting down the internet. Uh, so I believe we need uh, uh, international telecommunication bodies, international uh, like UN mechanism uh, to come together, all of us to come together and find a solution. Because what happened today in Iran could happen to everyone, all the countries that they don't like people to communicate each, with each other free. Uh, and yeah, I mean, uh, the reason that I'm here is like trying to find the solution that how international community can come together, have some sort of regulation, some sort of uh, uh, accountability that can keep a country like Iran accountable and stop them, or at least, you know, uh, do something that the, the, the price of internet shutdown would be like higher, not, not, not like what we are seeing uh, this day in Iran. Thank you. Thank you, Emil. I mean, it's very, I mean, I cannot say it's interesting, uh, but um, at this IGF, um, I, I noticed that there's this, there are many sessions on tech nationalism or digital sovereignty this year, and um, it's, it's, interest, it's interesting to see how Iran's like tech nationalism or network sovereignty is in, actually forced by um, U.S. economic economic sanctions, which, I mean, it's, it's a kind of side effect, isn't it? Um, mm. And if there's any any um, government, any people, for, any person from government or, or parliament, um, I would love to uh, have your comments on, on our panels. Uh, and next, next we have Koliwe. Um, thanks for that, Kelly. Um, I know I'm going to speak a lot and make reference to Zimbabwe, but um, I think I'll start off by mentioning that I think 2019 launched very vigorously for us on the African continent in terms of internet shutdowns, uh, because in, in, by January we had two countries, Sudan and the Democratic Republic of Congo, who had launched internet shutdowns that spilled into 2019. And then Gabon had um, an internet shutdown as well. Um, I think it was two weeks, a 48-hour 40, blackout. And then Zimbabwe, a week later, had a seven-day internet shutdown, which started off firstly as a total blackout, but then gradually became targeted at um, you know, specific social media platforms. But this was not the first time that Zimbabwe had had an internet shutdown because 2016, uh, we had had a sort of, uh, must have been about 12 hours uh, shutdown, but there was a lot of pressure um, from, you know, just Zimbabweans in general and on social media because at the time Facebook was more prominent but there was a huge following and a huge uh, number of Zimbabweans on Twitter and at the time, which is some, something which I find very significant, is that the minister of ICTs at the time was very open to a lot of conversation on social media so he sort of buckled down to that pressure and we got a restoration of, um, you know, the service but um, when we start looking at the trend of internet shutdowns and how they occur, I think what is more concerning is the processes or the events that happen before the internet shutdown and after the internet shutdown. So it's not really about the days when you have a blackout, because when you start to focus on the actual blackout itself, you start to wonder whether people were caught off guard. Because I think a lot of work is done by civil society and I think Access Now's presence is really uh, felt in terms of, you know, just like raising awareness on the impact of an internet shutdown, what to do when you have an internet shutdown. But I think that the questions and the conversation we should be having now is, are we, should we really be reacting um, to an internet shutdown and should or should we be more proactive and I think the Nigerian case um, with the election in February was very interesting to watch because the, the demands that were made by civil society um, and the noise around an internet shutdown even before it occurred 
actually forced the office of the, from the president's office, the national security office, to actually issue out a statement to say that they would definitely not shut down um, the internet. But also the contradictions within the African context to look at which particular office actually handles issues around internet shutdowns. So if you look at the Zimbabwean case, for instance, uh, MISA Zimbabwe, the Media Institute of Southern Africa, and the Zimbabwe Lawyers for Human Rights uh, during the internet shutdown took up a constitutional challenge um, against the internet shutdown. And what we got from that uh, uh, ruling was that the office that had actually issued or ordered the internet shutdown was not the right office. And this was the office um, of the Minister of National Security. Uh, but what it also gets you to reflect on is the fact that that ruling implies that if it was the president that had issued uh, the internet shutdown, there would have absolutely been nothing wrong with it. Um, and also just to look at the fact that internet shutdowns are generally very political uh, within the African sense. And um, if there's ever a time that uh, the private sector or the private players who are often coerced or co-opted into shutting down the internet um, within any African context, they should actually have a firm understanding around the laws that are used. So for instance, in Zimbabwe, that internet shutdown, if it had been effected or ordered by the president, would have been okay under the Interception of Communications Act. But what is interesting to note, or what is disturbing, is that firstly, that written directive alone was not issued to every service provider. It was targeted specifically at the most prominent or the bigger uh, telecoms operators, and within that context, the mobile network operators. And what do they do when they get the shutdown? They encourage everybody else, because Econet Wireless is the largest mobile network operator in, in Zimbabwe, and they actually issued out a statement that said that they had no choice and that they would encourage everybody else to um, shut down, which is, you know, the players. But we, we also need to have a conversation around how do we get governments to commit to not shutting down. And I think um, the reoccurrences of internet shutdowns in countries like Ethiopia and um, Gabon show how shameless the governments are, in fact. And at the time that we, uh, after the serv services were restored in Zimbabwe, the presidential spokesperson went on national radio to say that they would definitely effect another internet shutdown if they had to do it. So what does this do at a regional level when you look at the commitments that have been made by African states and governments themselves. Uh, so for us in 2018, we had the African uh, Union coming up with a declaration on internet governance where they were speaking specifically to issues around also cybersecurity, human rights, and freedom of expression, and actually speaking to issues relating to internet shutdowns. And then the governments would, will meet, obviously, at the African Internet Governance Forum but there is no sense of political will to get people to account or to even begin to have that conversation around you know, an internet shutdown and sort of get accountability or a proper strategy that, may, that shames governments that are continuously um, effecting um, internet shutdowns. And then of course that there's a lack of an interim coordinated approach um, that would actually make the principles. So we um, have been working around what is called the African Declaration on Internet Rights and Freedoms. And there's a, it's also been accepted at African Union level, but there's, there, there's nothing actually legally binding um, or there's a lack of commitment by African states to actually think about um, how you get a more, you know, firmer commitment from governments themselves. And then lastly for me would be that um, as much as there's a lot of solidarity um, and support and, uh, you know, just like the pressure when we have an internet shutdown, I think that there needs to be more than just an ad hoc sort of measure or response to internet shutdowns uh, by civil society themselves. But mostly, I think, also, how do we actually get the private sector to actually realize that at some point they would actually need to start thinking about which laws they need to start talking about um, getting repealed or amended that leaves them as vulnerable as they are because obviously the governments don't go and switch off. They need them to do it for them. Thanks. 
Okay, thank you, Collier. And, and the last but not the least, we have Ross from Etno. It's good morning, everyone, and um, and many thanks to everyone who has just uh, preceded me on the panel. I think listening already to the interventions that have just gone, it's extremely encouraging to know that while I do represent a different angle, I really think we are very much on the same page. No one wins from internet shutdowns. I want to speak briefly about some of the impacts perceived from the telco side and then look at some of the things we are doing. Uh, some calls have been made for change at the international level, uh, and I would echo those calls. I would echo those, uh, those needs. Um, so I'll, that's, that's the, the sort of structure of my intervention. Just to begin with, ETNO, the European Telecommunications Network Operators Association, uh, represents the, the biggest telcos in Europe. We have 30 or so members and some observers, and we represent 70% of the total sector investment in Europe. We have been operating from Brussels, uh, working on mostly EU policy since 1992, but our companies do have a global footprint. They are global companies. A government-mandated shutdown of the internet has countless impacts, not least human rights, as has been alluded to. But uh, I will repeat to actually what the other speakers have said already. It puts citizens' safety in the moment at risk. It disrupts economic uh, development. It disrupts the economic system of a country. Critical infrastructure, be that physical, digital, financial, is disrupted as it relies on the internet. So in fact, the threat against which any government is ostensibly seeking to cause protection, while that may be stopped disproportionately, you cause a whole raft of new problems which can't be denied. Indeed, government function in itself may cease uh, to go on. The economic uh, impact uh, is impacted from the very beginning from the moment the internet is shut down. That's a disruption of financial services, damaging local businesses, the loss of GDP, which, as I say, happens immediately. High connectivity countries uh, can lose up to 2% of their GDP per day that the internet is shut down. But these impacts wear on. Shutdowns put at risk foreign direct investment. They create trade barriers they produce a reputational risk for countries, which in the end, as we know, always hurts the citizens. Taking a step back to our position, the companies who have to effect the shutdown mandated by the government, technology companies and telcos are not exempt from the impacts. As Koliwe mentioned, there is sometimes a a lack of clarity on the laws which have to be respected, a lack of uh, certainty on the chain of command from, from which orders are coming. Telcos are in the position where they have to comply with the legal demands of the jurisdiction in which they operate. Our members have the protection in, in Europe of, of, of legal systems where, where this is much, much more difficult to get around, but it doesn't uh, undermine, it doesn't uh, mitigate the fact that we do have to comply with some very difficult orders. Moving briefly to the question of content, our position in Europe is that when it comes to content moderation and when it comes to the, the, the content put online, we don't want to be the judges of, of that content. We we will follow the, the orders that are given to us, provided they are found, uh, they find their basis in the rule of law, uh, EU law, and human rights law. I think this all comes down to a very important uh, need for trust. Trust needs to be at the center of every political and strategic decision going forward. And with regard to internet governance, this is 
this has been recognized at every level. Earlier this year, the Osaka track uh, approved by the, the G20 called for free flow of data with trust. Trust is vital for the provision of our services as telcos. And so from a telecoms perspective, scoring highly uh, in Europe in surveys on personal data protection, privacy and trust and the quality of our services, we need to ensure that citizens feel safe in their digital experiences. Citizens must be at the center of our decisions, and this applies to citizens uh, and users of our services wherever in the world they may be. Because after all, we develop services ensuring speed and reliability of networks for the benefit of the citizens and the economy, and shutdowns erode trust in our services and everything that relies on them. So what are we doing? Because I think that's the, the outcome we need to think of today. Uh, where next? First and foremost, in Europe there is mutual cooperation between the private sector and public authorities. We comply with national regulations and demands based on the rule of law, on EU law, and on human rights law. And concretely, outside the European context, we are involved in a number of uh, initiatives, which range from the broad to the specific, from the international to the regional. And I want to touch on a few of those. Our member companies are committed to the UN Global Contract, demonstrating our commitment to comply uh, and ensure compliance with human rights. In fact, each year our communications and progress from our companies highlight our mechanisms to monitor the effectiveness of policies, uh, highlight the existence of grievance mechanisms and uh, demonstrate our commitments. Commitment to the global contract means observing the UN Declaration on Human Rights and the UN Guiding Principles. Now going beyond this, a more sector specific approach is the Global Network Initiative, the GNI. And this is a multi-stakeholder voice in the face of government restrictions and demands, of which several of our telco members are part. And indeed, we are happy to sit around that same table with, uh, with other uh, actors, uh, Access Now, for example. The Global Network Initiative urges governments to be transparent, urges operators to communicate disruptions which need to be undertaken, and encourages cooperation among all stakeholders. To take a, a slightly different angle, looking at our commitment to human rights, ETNO, uh, as an organization itself, has signed a cooperation framework with the Council of Europe. The Council of Europe shapes and uh, directs the international norms with respect to human rights. And in fact, uh, quite a pertinent example of our most recent interactions with the Council of Europe uh, is our engagement on ethics and artificial intelligence. And last but not least, this week in this very place, Sir Tim Berners-Lee launched the Contract for the Web, which outlined principles for governments, companies, and citizens. It implies a dialogue, or a, a trialogue, uh, I suppose, if you will. It calls for working towards an ever-increasing quality of service and the development of online trust. The contract calls on governments to keep the internet available all of the time. And this, as, as my uh, fellow panelists have alluded to, requires legal and regulatory frameworks to minimize government-triggered disruptions. And so how can telcos contribute? We have been called to make the internet affordable and accessible by working towards an ever-increasing quality of service, ensuring speed, performance, and crucially, reliability. Going forward, our work, I uh, speak, of all of us is, is based on trust. Our work, uh, as, as uh, Melody and Amir have also alluded to, re requires a multi-stakeholder dialogue. It requires an international solution. We must inform the public debate and encourage the appropriate laws and norms. Governments are called to keep all of the internet available all of the time establishing the right legal and regulatory frameworks to minimize government-triggered disruptions. And I think it goes without saying that we all need to be around that table. We all need to be part of that process. 
the drafters of those laws and regulations, the legislatures, the governments, international organizations, the private sector, and the civil society. Okay, thank you, Ross. Um, we don't have much time, so I will just open the floor. So if anyone has, a, have, has comments or questions. Could you just come up uh, to the table and use the mic? Thank you very much um, for those super interesting um, statements. My question would be, how do you think the learning process works also between states considering internet shutdown or the sort of control and censorship on the internet? Um, have you picked out any mechanisms there or is it more a mechanism that is very centered around national needs? I mean, if we just look at the statistics and the fact that um, in 2018, we counted shutdowns in 25 countries. In 2019, and unfortunately, the year is not even over, and December is often a, a popular month for shutdowns. But the year is not even over, and we're already at 35 countries. So that's 10 more countries. It can appear as insignificant, but it's actually crucial because it's a, it's a really significant increase in the, in the past two years. And so it shows, I mean, of course, the more that you normalize the practice, it has regional effect. I mean, Koli, we mentioned uh, just in the African continent, but sometimes even in a specific region in Africa, how when one country issues a shutdown, it can in, it inspire its neighbors especially when there are no repercussions, when there is total impunity, and when, I mean, of course, there are um, economic uh, impact, there are like the, the consequences are often devastating for communities, but in terms of um, sanctions, in terms of um, litigation, it's actually so far quite difficult to hold government accountable for issuing shutdowns. So, that's why so much of our efforts actually, instead of being reactive, we're trying to be more proactive. And by bringing the, the, the debate, when we look at the similarities, if not in method, but in impact of internet shutdowns and cyber attacks, we see a discrepancy between the efforts to, to, to counter cyber attacks and the efforts to counter shutdowns. And we're very grateful to have you know, pro proclamations and, um, you know, like the contract for the web that Ross just mentioned had a, has a specific section on internet disruption, but uh, the enforcement mechanisms are not clear. And so if we were, for example, to look at some norms that already exist within the realm of cyber attacks, um, we could try to see how uh, behavior could be en encourage, uh, encouraging states um, so if I'm just, I don't know them by heart, but if we look at uh, the Global Commission on the Stability of Cyberspace, they, they suggested some norms for responsible behavior in cyberspace, and some of those norms um, are, are quite clear. If I can just quote, uh, one second. And, and you can see, I mean, you will tell me if you can see uh, how they could apply to internet shutdowns. But there is one norm that says, state and non-state actors should neither conduct nor knowingly allow activity that intentionally and substantially damages the general availability or integrity of the public core of the internet, and therefore the stability of cyberspace. There is another norm that says, state and non-state actors must not pursue, support, or allow cyber operations intended to disrupt the technical infrastructure essential to elections, referenda, and plebiscites. So when we see, especially in 2019, the increase of shutdowns during elections, we can see how a norm that is normally intended to prevent cyber attacks um, could apply perfectly to, to curtailing and preventing internet shutdowns. So, so far, unfortunately, the statistics are not in our favor, but that's why we're hoping that by having these discussions, especially in such fora, and we would have loved to have had a, a representative for, from a state at, at this panel. Um, and we really encourage states to, to, to contribute and to take part because we believe that they are 
an essential um, actor in, in the solutions. Thank you very much for your very interesting contributions. I wanted to get back to the example of Iran, which I quite, find quite fascinating, because we, we, we see what is done by a government to minimize economic effects, to, to minimize that so services run smoothly, but that the freedoms are still reduced. And we have this in, in so many countries now. If you look at the, the law which was passed in November in Russia, for example, we, we see this more and more. So how do we deal with this? We are now discussing, of course, disruption because this is at the center, but we see what follows to, to keep the economic shocks low. So what could we do on this? Thank you for your question. Uh, well, actually, Russian are, uh, as, as long as I know, to the best of my knowledge, uh, they are still far from uh, where Iran is standing now. They just passed some law, but as far as I know, they didn't implement the network itself in the, in, inside the country. And uh, still ISPs are like allowed to get the internet independently from the government. Of course, they need to get a license. But it's not like Iran that there is one unique gateway that they have to go through that gateway to get, the, get their, uh, their own internet. Uh, I'm, I mean, uh, I think that th there is a lack of uh, international law and policy. Because again, Iran, is, it's not about Iran. What Iran did can be like, like a role, role model. And every, all of these countries like Russia and India, uh, you know, what we see in, in Africa uh, countries, uh, all, all of them, they, they can see this as, as like a good solution for them to control the internet. And what makes me like worried is like it's, we, we will see it like fragmentation of in internet in the future. All of them, they want to have their own uh, national internet and control it. So I, I think there is, a, I mean, I, I, just, I just understood after the, this sh internet shutdown in Iran that there is nothing in terms of uh, international policy, international law. There is nothing at ICU level or there is nothing at, at UN level. Uh, th there is no any kind of regulation that can keep the country like Iran or Russia or this kind of country accountable and don't let them to shut down the internet because again, the network itself is not a problem. Actually, because of that network, we have now in Iran access to more in um, faster internet and reliable internet. But the problem is who control that internet? Who have uh, the actually uh, uh, po power to control the internet? Just, just today, I saw that the, the deputy, minister, uh, deputy to the Ministry of Telecommunication he, 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 he said that he's working on a uh, bill to propose to the uh, parliament that if there is another shutdown, they need to have uh, approval by, by the parliament. But that does, just, just doesn't make any sense because there should be no shutdown. It doesn't matter who is in charge of approving shutdown or not, there should be any ch shutdown. So uh, again, we should look at Iran as a case study uh, to find a solution internationally. All the telecommunication bodies, all the international regulation at ITU, at uh, UN, uh, because th this is a, like a new trend. People are not really familiar with what's going on, what is this, wh why this happened. Uh, that, that would be one solution. In case of Iran specifically, another solution would be removing sanctions, removing tech sanctions, providing more access to the international infrastructure and international services. So people can actually use that to make sure that first of all, they, their data is safe. And second of all, if there is a shutdown, their services would be like shut down. They can provide service for their customers. Uh, hello, and thank you for an interesting discussion. I'm Tapani Tarvanen from Electronic Frontier of Finland, not the foundation. And I'd like to raise the possibility of a technological development that might change this equation. 
There are several projects putting low orbit satellites that can be reached directly by phones. If this technology becomes cheap enough that uh, direct satellite access from a phone becomes a standard feature on every phone, how will this break things down? How will these governments that want to control the internet fight back? What will happen? Thank you for your question. Can you hear me? Yeah. <clears throat> Thank you for your question. Um, I mean, certainly that cuts the that cuts the problem off uh, at the source. Um, that would uh, keep networks open. I can't speak on the the technology behind it or the feasibility of when that will become affordable because our members don't uh, in their entirety. Uh, provide such solutions, but um, but perhaps we can we can get in touch and I can I can discuss with you later if that's possible. So. Okay, um, I see no more hands. So oh, okay, one last comment or question. Hello, everyone. My name is Mam Isutujalo. Um, I'm here to represent a youth group called the Give One Project in Gambia. Um, um, we've been working on um, training girls on um, internet courses and digital, digital rights and codings and everything. Um, and we are really doing well when it comes to that side. But the problem we have in 2016, we had a shutdown as well in Gambia. Um, so what we do recently, we had a program that we are collaborating with Internews where we have a radio program and, and we sensitize, um, we enlighten people on digital, um, the, the, the media laws, okay, and um, the digital rights and everything. Um, and recently, we've been having courtesy call um, to our parliamentarians and, and policy makers. Because the problem is in Gambia, the youth are so into technology and so into the internet, but the policy makers, especially our leaders, are not into it that much. So what we do, we had a courtesy call going to their offices and then at least trying to enlighten them about um, the benefits of the internet, about technology and everything. So it, it went to a level that whereby um, recently we are revising our constitution and they were, they sent, they were, we were sent um, um, a survey on what does the youth want on the policy to be added, um, on what what to be added on the constitution. And as a youth group, with, collab um, with other youth groups, what we do, um, 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 we collaborate together and make sure that um, the internet policy uh, included, as well as gender policies. So these are the things that we are working and it is really helping us and things are going well. So what we do is like you as a people, um, you ask um, to help us um, in order to, um, collaborate with our government our policy, um, policy makers, um, for example, in terms of um, international laws, in order to stop the shutdown. Thank you. Uh, thank you for sharing Gambia's case. Uh, so, okay, we are almost at the end of the session, and I will give uh, like 30 seconds for each speaker to wrap up. Um, who wants to go first? Okay. Um, thank you for that. I just also wanted to make a contribution around the satellite issues. I, from an African perspective, I think that we would probably also need to really look at the licensing regimes, because I think even just having satellite presence is um, needs to go through some sort of licensing with the you know relevant authority and I think from my country there's the conflict between we still have a broadcasting authority and then we have um, the postal and regulatory authority and they're trying to merge that but also that there's always been uh, you know just um, politics around frequency spectrum so it's something definitely to look at but also just the regulator the regulatory and licensing implications Uh, I feel like I spoke quite a lot, but uh, no, thank you very much for um, 
allowing us to have this discussion and contributing to the discussion. Uh, I really like the, the question about the, the satellite as a, an alternative to, to find a ways to, to circumvent and actually the, the community has really tried to find ways to, to circumvent internet shutdowns. There are lots of things that we're talking about and at Access Now we're also trying to provide tips and advice to communities when they face a shutdown. Uh, one of our partners and, and Keep It On member, uh, Witness, uh, developed a tool to give advice to people to how, how to document human rights violations and human rights abuse when there is a shutdown, including by uh, offline mechanisms and tools. So there are definitely um, a, a lot of possibilities, although we, we should still <laughs> focus on, on preventing shutdowns from happening in the, in the first place, and that I think would require real effort and commitment from, from this community. Thank you. Just touching on something that Melody said, circumvention is, of course, in this uh, situation, uh, perhaps a helpful alternative. Um, I think we all agree that the ideal is ensuring that it never happens in the first place. Um, something that was mentioned also in the, the question and answer time was what can we do instead of uh, only having high level uh, non-binding documents coming every so often doing largely the same thing. Certainly from my perspective from the private sector, an important way to ensure accountability and to ensure effectiveness is to have uh, concrete um, reporting mechanisms and those must be uh, quantifiable. For example, just looking at the, the UN Global Contract, our members do respond every year their, their commitments and quantify uh, what they are doing. Well, uh, I would just want to thank, uh, you know, during the really hard time uh, that we had during the internet shutdown in Iran, I, I really want to thank the uh, internet freedom community, all the friends, colleagues who stand with us and help us. And just quickly to the, uh, talking about the satellite, I'm honestly, uh, regardless, regardless of how technically it's possible or not, uh, I, I'm, I'm, uh, I'm worried that maybe if, if even that's possible, the U.S. is going to do a sanction again on that as well. So we, we need to think it like more, more broadly. We need to think that how we damage and, and not only prevent the internet shutdown, also prevent the damage. Thank you. Okay, thank you everybody for listening. Good morning for those uh, that are here for the Cyber Norms workshop. Let's begin as soon as possible. We only have one hour and a lot of things to discuss, so we are starting on time. Over there.
pura llegada, llegas y todo con carrera. Igual llegas. Welcome, welcome to workshop 63, usual suspects questioning the cyber norm making boundaries. Good morning. Hope you're all well. This is actually the fourth episode of our wonderful IGF series that started back in 2016, yes. when we introduced cyber norms as a subject, uh, in our opinion, very much within scope of internet governance discussions. And I think the series could have gone in two ways. Uh, one, as a good drama, where the technical community could have said, hey, there is this almost two decades long process in the UN First Committee that we haven't heard much about, that everybody's talking about these days, 20 years later, and that can have an effect of altering ways in which the internet behaves, particularly when bad things happen. And from there, a back and forth between the technical people and the government saying, I am the expert. No, I am the expert. No, I am more expert. And you know, the drama evolves like that. So it is very fortunate that uh, our series of workshops have not uh, turned uh, very dramatic. I would say that we have tried hard uh, for them to be more like a romantic comedy. Um, so what is it that we are trying to do here? Essentially, this is all about two disparate communities, governmental and technical, to be able to understand each other a little bit better, and there is no better meeting place to arrange a date between these communities than the IGF. Also, we think a very good subject of conversation is cyber norms, uh, because they are, in a way, the future of internet governance, certain agreements that impact behavior that shape the way the internet works. After three successful IGF workshops, I'm glad that our usual suspects, uh, both from government and the technical community, have agreed to meet again for a date. Um, just here and now in public, uh, recorded on video, transcribed. Uh, so um, from the technical community, who do we have here? And well, basically two communities in one, uh, the CSERT community, the first responders, the ones that at, are at the very front line of cyber incidents, many of them outside the governmental sphere, some of them within, but with a long history of cooperation through trusted channels. We also have here network operators. Ultimately, they are the ones that might tell if a norm is meaningful, as all behavior online occurs within their premises. On the other side, there is the policy community, mostly governmental, having trouble to agree on basic rules on how to be responsible with each other, basic norms of civility. So welcome both sides for an open discussion full of sharing and caring. And uh, Madeline, it is an absolute privilege to be working with you in this uh, series, uh, in, in this romantic comedy. <laughs> And uh, our role here, uh, I think, perhaps is like a couple's therapists, you know, and we're bringing issues out uh, and, and trying to build or fix these relationships. Uh, what, what, what do you think? <laughs> oh, thank you, Pablo. 
I think all relationships need work, so, uh, you know, and, and sometimes some maintenance. So, uh, yeah, let's see what we can do in an hour. Um, and I guess, look, if, if we, uh, to extend the metaphor, if we, if we uh, say that men are from Mars and women are from Venus, then I guess to an extent the, the tech community is uh, from Jupiter and the policy community is, is from Saturn. And this kind of uh, intergalactic exchange is something that Pablo and I have really um, enjoyed over the last four years and, and feel to be very, very important. Um, the, the, the reason why we think it's so important is because we have been able to push each other and explain to one another different perspectives to our own. And that has expanded our own thinking. And that's, that's something that we try to bring into these workshops is the opportunity for us all to be open to the idea that we don't understand perfectly other perspectives, and it would help if we if we did understand them better, because essentially we can see, and we all this is nothing new. We we all acknowledge and understand these problem of knowledge exchange between the technical community and the policy community, and the recognition that that's not a one way uh, that that's not a one way problem. That while the policy community always uh, benefits from having better technical advice and, and technical understanding, but also that the technical community very, um, very much would benefit from a better understanding of policy constraints and policy objectives, because there there can quite often be something of a of a gap there. Um, I think one of the initiatives that the Secretary General announced on, on Tuesday, this idea of appointing a tech envoy, the, the, a recommendation from the high-level panel uh, report, is a really positive move because I struggle to think of any other area of science diplomacy or technical diplomacy where we, we see so little effective exchange between the scientific or technical community and the diplomatic community. If we were working on uh, nuclear diplomacy or, or climate change governance, we see much better um, engagement with the technical and scientific community than we do uh, necessarily in, in this space. The IGF, of course, is a perfect opportunity for us to do this because these communities come together here. Um, I just want to lay out uh, very quickly what I see as differing perspectives here. And this emerges from the conversations that we've had over the last four years and over the last 48 hours. And that is a recognition here. A lot of us in this room would have been to norm sessions over the last few days. And a lot of us have been to, to a number of technical sessions. The, the international um, negotiations over norms of responsible state behavior come from a, quite a different place. They don't come necessarily from a place of wanting to uh, ensure secure transactions over a network or secure um, uh, communications. So really what's happening in, in, at that level is an effort to prevent instability and to prevent an escalation that could come about from a misunderstanding or miscommunication to a kinetic war. So that, that's the, that is the objective of those policymakers and those diplomats. What we're talking about at the technical level of cybersecurity is quite, you know, it, it's different. And I think there's a gap there that we need to be mindful of when we, when we, we uh, take the conversation forward to today. And I think it will come out at, at, at different points in our conversation. With that, I'd like to throw over to our, our the third of the three musketeers to Louise Marie Hural, who will uh, take us through a, a kind of setup of, of, of the norms that we'll, we'll talk about today. Absolutely. Um, it's a pleasure to be here. It's a pleasure to be collaborating for the past years. And really, as Pablo and Madeline have already said, it's really about creating a space for dialogue. And by actually using the term usual suspects, we are trying to see, OK, so how can we bring those that are not the usual suspects to the table? How can we actually ensure that we are bringing the experiences from both sides and 
just having a conversation about that. And just to set the scene really quickly, um, I think before we, we start sharing a bit more, I think the bigger question over here is how do we see norms and what do we perceive as being a norm? Obviously, at the kind of high-end level that Madeline was talking about, we have, you know, the UNGGE reports that prescribe and, and actually uh, refer to particular norms. But there's also the, the understanding that norms are kind of the everyday practices. So how can we reconcile these, these two realities? How can we reconcile these experiences? Um, so norms um, are... As, I, as we were talking about, they are political artifacts, be it at the technical level, be it at, at the high-end political level. They are political mechanisms that trigger specific actions. They constrain and enable at the same time. And at the GGE, uh, there is one particular norm that